Hello again. Today we're looking at a Sartorius analytic brand of analytical balance. So designed to measure very precise small masses like down to micrograms. But this one doesn't turn on. Now if I do plug in the adapter which has uh, one 11 volt rail, one at 19 and one at negative 21 volts. Let me plug that in. Get that really horrible noise. Oh, that doesn't sound good at all. So I'm wondering if the power supply is not capable of supplying the current demands of this unit. I also just noticed something. That is, that is not good. You see that? The LCD is sitting crooked, which tells me this whole thing has been dropped. So it may not be the power supply, it might be a fault internal. I think perhaps the easiest way to know for sure is to take this apart. Uh, we can at least check the voltages while it's plugged in. And if they are correct under load, we know the fo there's, there's other faults inside the unit. It's got this uh, neat little box around it. I understand the box is designed to stop wind currents and things from upsetting the measurements because I guess if you're measuring micrograms and someone farts across the other side of the room you could probably see it fluctuate on your reading. It's not immediately obvious how it comes apart. There might be, maybe you have to take that uh, box off the top, I don't know yet. There's a couple of screws under here but their position I don't know because they're right under the measuring unit. I don't know if I want to loosen them off in case it upsets something. And then there's this plate here. There's an overhang here. So maybe the top is supposed to lift off the base. And maybe there's some some screws that we're supposed to maybe hidden under here perhaps or something. Or maybe the top, maybe this section comes off and there's screws under there. Let's have a poke around. We're just having it lying on its side, this whole lower plate, and looks like the little bit in the middle, uh, kind of fell off. <laughs> so, I maybe I take the, the glass box off, and then this tray and whatnot just lifts out the way, and we get access that way. Well, that just come off the middle, and it's on a little pogo pin there that uh, it is spring-loaded, so that creates a perfect balance point of balance I suppose. Uh, now the bottom plate that is loose so maybe we can just lift that out. And then we can see a screw there one over the back one over the, the other so one one in the back and two in the front corners yellow plate but we also have a bunch around the edge here um, so perhaps we loosen off those ones around the edge and see if the box comes off on this frame perhaps you've been promoted to the tripod it does feel like this box is going to come off now with those outer perimeter screws but i'm still not 100 percent sure No, these little round yellow pieces. I'll see if I can pr pry that off. It didn't feel like it wanted to come nicely. Uh, no, that's just decoration. It's uh, <laughs> entirely decoration. That's interesting. But we do have... There's a screw in each corner. Could also be holding it down. It could just be a stopper for the sliders, but let's... Take them off and find out. So we have a, a uh, plate with a little plastic bushing. Some kind of uh, spring tension, little plastic spring tension thing that should be stuck under that band. It just came off. It's a double sided tape there is let go. Maybe this bar stays there and we just have to unclip all the glass from around it. 
was trying to figure out how to get this cover off to try and separate this arm from the glass. It slides up. <laughs> I mean, they've been on there for a long time, but it slides up. Uh, it's the same with these ones there as well. They just slide up. Uh, how does that come off? So the plastic... Oh, okay, so the plastic bits come off after the screws. No, they kind of stick to the glass. They could stay there. It's just the glass has to come unstuck from the... There we go, the base surround. So they've got like a little bit of double-sided tape in between the glass and the base as well. We now have the glass box removed. Uh, I think these three screws here are going to anchor the yellow plate to the uh, rest of the system. Wouldn't it be funny if I could have just undone those three screws and taken the whole yellow piece off with the uh, glass box attached? <laughs> wouldn't that be just... <laughs> wouldn't that be just... Now there is a connector right down here that attaches to the upper keypad. Unplug that. And yeah, the LCD is just flapping around in the breeze. It uh, is only held on by double-sided tape, which has let go like all the other double-sided tape on this machine. I wonder what the date on this is. Do we have a code on the chips here? 8612, is that going to be 1986? 12th week, I don't know. There's another one, 8610, 8514. Might be quite old. There's some techy stuff going on under there. All sorts of mechanisms and things. It's actually a, a motor here. So I'm not sure what they're driving exactly. A little switch unit on the back of the rotating shaft that this is fun operating. So some early adoption of uh, chip on glass it's kind of cool they're, they're big enough for you to actually see it yeah that's really neat we'll uh, put some isopropyl alcohol on that let it soak in so that it comes off nice and easily and we don't have to worry about too much uh, of the alignment because it's um it's perfectly central on the the LCD on the, so as long as we put the tape on here and line the LCD up exactly it'll be quite all right let's see if that's gonna oh yeah that makes uh, pretty short work of that so, it used to be like a foam so I think what's happened is the foam in between has deteriorated and it's still got the adhesive stuck to both surfaces if they didn't go for the foam method like most foam does deteriorate, then it would have never been an issue. So you got to, once you get one edge of the tape lifted, it makes it a lot easier. Maybe a bit of hot air might, might be easier. <laughs> the alcohol's not quite soaking through like I thought it might. And number two done. Uh, hot air is a far easier method, uh, 100 degree hot air, and it peeled right off. Uh, the alcohol was quite a slow method. The glass is quite fragile on the LCD. I'll contemplate the best way of taking the tape off that. I think a little bit of hot air on that uh, should be fine. I think, let's see, make sure we can actually get this to work first and then worry about the LCD, because that's kind of unnecessary work if this is junk now anyway. I'm going to plug in the power supply and uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. My money's on this thing twitching away but let's see and on. No! I wonder what's going on under there. Well perhaps we take a voltage measurement at the plug where it comes in here. I'll put this on it so to make it quiet can't hear yourself think over that. Now, what did I say? We've got minus 21, 19, and 11. I wonder if they kept the same color code. Brown, red, orange, yellow. Where's the black one? Hmm. I should have... Okay, what have we got to brown? If I go chassis to brown, 
we got anything there? So 3.3, well that's not right. 17, orange, nothing, yellow, minus 1. Orange is positive with respect to yellow. 1.4, no, no. When it wasn't plugged in I was getting 27 volts. Red is positive with respect to orange. And I was getting 28 volts unplugged, so there's 17. Maybe that's our 19 volt rail. It's not written on the board, unfortunately, so I'm not 100% sure. Black and brown, which we don't have a black. Yeah, that was definitely a separate rail. For some reason, we've only got one, two, three, four wires coming in from our power supply. Just unplugged the power pack, and it is really hot really hot in fact that's wow that's way too hot okay let's have a look if we have any maybe shorts on the rail i was measuring there we had quite low voltage across some of those so what have we got for input resistance i'm just gonna we'll go ground to brown or chassis to brown that's 10 mega ohms all right we'll go um orange to yellow because that seem to be pulled down yellow to orange oh uh, yeah a couple of k and then we'll go red to orange uh, under a meg under a meg so if we're not getting low resistance there i wonder what's going on with our power pack i'm just going to go between all of them just out of curiosity because they all kind of nothing there that says overload when I plugged it in earlier, there was nothing on the LCD. So maybe the problem's in here. Maybe maybe the caps are no good. Jeez, as soon as I popped the top off, I could smell the varnish. Like, what? <laughs> Something's not right at all. Yeah, I can't touch that. Uh, that core is stinking hot. I'll just clamp the thing in my vise there just to help soak the heat out of the core for a bit. So I've attached uh, wires to a mains cable, just soldered them on there because they're only a press fit connection in the housing. And soldered a ground wire on there so we can check easily with a scope and see what the output voltage looks like. So I'm going to be probing. We've got three capacitors here. So this ground wire does the two on the left. It's because I've got a split rail supply thing going on there with our, with our negative voltage. So we'll be nice and quick about this because I don't like the sound of what's going on. Plugging in and checking the first capacitor on the on the left there. What have we got? Oh, that's not good. That's at one volt per division. The next cap in in the middle. Oh, that's just as bad. All right, and then if we attach directly onto the last cap there, uh, a little bit going on there as well. In that short space of time. That little bridge rectifier down the bottom for this rail got really hot. So I did a resistance check across here to see if there's something shorting out that rail. But there's not. It's, it's up around a couple thousand ohms. So I'm going to go with... Um, let's replace all three capacitors and check again, see what's going on there. Grab each one. Okay, we'll heat one at a time and then wiggle it over. You just want to be careful though that when you wiggle it, when you wiggle it, that that the pressure you create on the other pin doesn't push up and push the pad off the PCB, which has happened in the past. Good old experience. And then you get the legs in the holes and do it again. And once they take I should really clear the hole that you can almost wiggle them enough that the solder doesn't stick and, and kind of clears the hole out in the process. That one was slightly smaller diameter than the original, but that's okay. Of course, you remembered to unplug this thing before you did that, right? 
These ones are 1000 microfarad at uh, 40 volts and this is a 2200 microfarad at uh, 25 volts. Plug it in and see if it still makes that horrible noises. And it does. What does our scope look like? Yeah, still really bad. What's up with that? So on this heatsink, we have uh, this end is our uh, 7805 5 volt regulator. And I think we have a negative rail regulator here. Under thermal imaging, it's hitting about 35, 40 degrees, the 5 volt regulator. So maybe we look at that because I think that rail with the uh, bridge rectifier that's getting hot because it hit about 50, 60 degrees in a short amount of time. I think we'll check the output of that regulator and just see what the resistance to ground is on that. Hopefully the metal is ground if I check a capacitor nearby. So our resistance on the output pin of our 7805 is... 800 ohms. I wouldn't have thought that was too low either. On our input, we have very high resistance input. Still, I don't think there's an issue there. I'll just check the output of the other regs to see what's going on there. No low resistances there. I wonder if we unplug the uh, the whole balance mechanism and just see if it's still a problem with only the board connected. It's just really well clipped in there. I don't see any retaining clips. There we go. And the other side, it's even bigger. No, nope, not too bad. There we go, so we get that one out of the way as well. And that isolates the whole mechanism. And we can see if... We're not going to hear anything, but I suppose we can see if anything's going to get hot again, or if... Uh, maybe if our ripple goes away. Okay. So plugging in, and we'll measure our ripple. That's still really bad. Yeah, I don't know what's going on there. And our bridge rectifier is still getting hot. And with uh, no load, so I've unplugged the power supply from the unit, and we are not having any ripple at all. Unless the transformer's gone bad, and maybe it's got a shorted winding, and it's actually failing under load and, and it, in, in itself it can't supply what the normal current demands are just checking resistance from the side that gets the bridge rectifier that gets hot and that's our i'm not sure what rail that should be but that comes through to that connector on the board here's what i'm looking at so here's our our power supply we have the brown wire We've got brown, black, orange, yellow, and red. All right, so the brown wire is going to the negative. Goes to the negative of this capacitor, which is our really hot bridge rectifier. What have we got there? There's a oh, black wire, okay. Black wire here goes to the positive. Positive of this capacitor. So, you would have thought that they'd follow the colors the same through to the board because they've got brown, red, orange, and yellow. I don't have black. What have they done with the black wire? Have they just tied it to the chassis? There's a little board down here that, where the power comes in. There's a bunch of inductors in series with each rail and a few little capacitors on there. Look like tantalums. And then it just runs off after that to the main board. I wonder where our black wire is terminating. Is it actually the chassis? Brown wire. Okay, brown wire goes to chassis. And it also looks like yellow wire. Sorry, orange wire. Orange wire also goes to chassis. 
I'm just going to note that down. Now let's see if we can follow through from the positive of each capacitor and where it ends up in the board if it does. It has to. Okay, this is the connector where it comes in from our input. I'm on the black wire which is positive for our overheating rail. And I'm just going to go down the connector and it looks like brown. Brown, so black becomes brown. All right, cool. Next on the list is orange, but orange and orange and well, orange and brown and uh, earth. So we'll go to yellow. Does yellow come through to yellow at this end? Yes, it does. Does red come through to red? It does. Now, which one of these wires goes to our five volt regulator? I wonder. I want the input to the 5 volt regulator and it is, it is that brown wire. I put my own voltage source on the 5 volt side and we'll just see maybe how much current it's trying to draw. At least I could do that, that means the logical power up. We won't have our 19 volt rail, I don't know what that's used for, or our negative 21 volt rail, um, we won't have that either. Maybe it's using that for op amps actually, there's a thought. It's probably got a, a um, there's a, it's funny it's positive 19 and minus 21. The 19's rated at 140 milliamps and the 21's rated at 25 milliamps. Which is really not a lot, actually. And the 11 volt line's rated at 300 milliamps. And that's our 5 volt rail, so the whole thing doesn't use a lot of power. I'm going to stick 5 volt, uh, well, I'm going to stick 11 volts, which is what it should have on this regulator, and just see what happens. So I just stuck a couple of wires on that capacitor, clipped up my bench supply, and I'm going to feed in 11 volts. And that's uh, fine, uh, you know, 5 volt regulators often take 12 volt input, but that's what they're doing. In this instance, let's have a look at what happens on our uh, bench supply there. Here we go, plugging it in. Oh, and it is clipped to 600 milliamps, 5 volt. So something's really loading that up. And as we don't have an overly high resistance reading on the output of this regulator, so I'm starting to think maybe the regulator itself is faulty and just dumping it to ground uh, internally because the regulator did get to about 35 degrees pretty quickly uh, and it is bolted to a heat sink so it wasn't really overloading but that's all I can think of nothing else was getting hot with the thermal camera it's probably a bad 5 volt regulator I think of course if you didn't have a thermal camera and you weren't sure what was going on there since you can't measure, like I said, there's not a low resistance on the output of the regulator. What about just jamming 5 volts on the output of the regulator? We could try that and see how much current it draws then. Uh, let's back that off a bit so we don't destroy everything. And we'll get about uh, 5 volts. Uh, and everything's secure. And then I will apply power. And look! A few milliamps. So that's a good start. So it's looking like our 5 volt regulator is bad. Either that or something between the input and the 5 volt regulator. But we're going to have to get the board out either way, I think. So we will uh, we'll, uh, rip into this and see what we can come up with. So to get this board out, we're going to have to undo this screw. So there's no thermal compound there, it's just strapped down for a little bit extra. Probably just stop it wiggling about. Like that one there. Um, now that's on a post, is that post is not holding the motherboard down, so we have a screw at this end. And a couple of screws by this heat sink come out. No, we still have a couple of screws on the back of the heat sink here. Now I'm starting to think I didn't need to remove the ones in the board. Here we go. I could have I could have left these ones. I could have left these ones on 
in each corner because the thread is on the bottom of the board there. Here's where the 5 volt rig attaches. I think I'll, I'll just remove the screw holding it down and I will uh, just again I'll flood the pins with solder and uh, once they're all liquid just pull it off the board. It'll be the easiest way. There's a little mylar insulator behind it or some sort of plasticky type insulator. Just need to support that on something. We'll just clamp it in the vise each side of that heat sink that's already mounted on the board. It does the job. Add a bit of solder to the thing just to give us a bit of help. And then some tweezers, just get the tab of the regulator. A bit of a wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. Wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. Remove the solder with a bit of wick from the holes there. Oh, no. It's not strong enough for me to lean on it. If it is the regulator, we should be able to put power on this thing and it should draw excessive amount of current as it is. So I'm going to try that. Okay, I just got the power supply clipped on here. Uh, left pin positive in tab or center pin ground right pin is our output when i apply power it's not drawing an excessive amount of current and it's regulating to five volts so this is not our problem so what could possibly be going on between the input and the regulator that is causing this thing to draw a stupid amount of power it can't be anything after the regulator because we stuck five volts on the board and it only pulled a few few milliamps 60 milliamps so there can't be a fault on this board at least on the output side so what else could there be on the input side that could be loading up once once power is applied looking at the pcb under the microscope there's one track from the input connector to the input lead of this rig and there's a small electrolytic capacitor on that uh, track that's the only thing on the input other than what is on the back of the machine on the PCB that holds the socket where we have looks like a couple of tantalums and inductors I'm wondering if maybe it's one of those tantalums breaking down on the input there I think what I'll do I'll apply 11 volts to the board directly at the input and if it's good, with the board unplugged, I'll apply it to the input on the back of the machine and see if it still draws excessive current. It could be this tantalum's breaking down only when voltage is applied, but still measures a high resistance uh, when there's no voltage. We'll clip onto the heatsink for ground, and I will grab my probe for 11 volts. And pop that onto the input connector, which was the left wire, uh, left pin, which was the brown wire. And I shall apply 11 volts. Here goes. Nothing. Cool. No current drawn. So that electrolytic isn't the one that's breaking down. Let's pop that aside. Grab the rest of this now what I could do is also probe the lead I could probe that end or I could apply it back on the AC adapter is our AC adapter that gives us direct access to the input wires there. So let's apply that. Now, where's my lead? So we are uh, negative on there and positive there. Of course, the only other thing on here is the new capacitor and the bridge rectifier. <laughs> it won't be those, I'm pretty sure. Um, 
Okay, applying voltage. Oh, and no, what? No, that's not doing anything. <gasps> what? Okay, there was a, a moment click of the power supply as it charged that capacitor, but it is not drawing an excessive current just, just connected to the back of the machine. Now I'm really confused. It's, 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 it doesn't make sense. So I have the regulator reinstalled. I'm just going to do this test again. I'm going to pump 11 volts into the rig and just see if we have our overcurrent situation. Here we go. Ah, oh, what? And we don't now. What is going on? It is pulling 50 milliamps, which is what we had roughly when we put 5 volts into the output of the regulator. Did I fix the regulator by soldering it? There's, there's nothing there that could be a problem. I will plug it back into the input lead and we will try again and just see, just try and rule out, is that input line causing the problem? Plug in our input lead. We will go from the transformer through the input lead at the back to the main board with our bench supply. <gasps> no! 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 <laughs> What's going on? Can't you can't just put it back together like this and give it back to them? It might not work. <laughs> <laughs> it'll it'll fail you fail again dang so why why all of a sudden is it now not in an overload situation all i did is remove and resolder in the uh regulator i'm just gonna do that again no i'm just gonna wiggle the input plug no nothing going on there maybe i'll blow some hot air down at the input connector on those those tantalums over the back there, let's just, uh... no, nothing really going on there. I can't leave it like this. How about, how about I plug in the mains again uh, and we see what it does. Let's use its own transformer and uh, see uh, what it does. How am I going to see what it does? Do I plug the mechanism back in? It was still overloading before that. But if I don't plug it in, I won't hear if there's any noises or anything like we were getting. So let's just reattach that. There we go. Plug it in and see if we get any weird noises again. Still making those noises. What's our voltages doing? Oh! Oh! Shit! <laughs> okay! <laughs> oh my god, that stinks! Well, if there's one way to find out what the problem is, is just wait for it to blow up and identify itself. And here we have a very angry tantalum capacitor. Um, half the reason we had so much smoke is that this polystyrene block right beside it melted as a result. I'm glad that happened. It could have taken a while to find. Um, maybe I didn't see it on the thermal camera because it was behind this block. Clearly that cap was becoming short only when it had voltage applied to it. Why it didn't do it when uh, uh, we applied 5 volts to the output? I don't know. I don't even know if this is on the 5 volt line. It could be on one of the other rails and that's why that rail had so much ripple on it. Now we've got a place to start looking and uh, track it back to which rail it is and replace that and see how it goes. Well. <laughs> I was like, I wonder what that bit of polystyrene is for, even. Like, 
I thought it might have something to do with supporting the LCD or something like that. And then I was like, hang on a sec. There's, um, there's some pins underneath it. So what's it sitting on top of? Well, now we have a hole in the middle. There's a little, uh, a little package. Multi-legged, what, four-legged, five-legged package. And something else in there. Clearly, this is some kind of uh, thermal, thermally controlled thing where it's designed to maintain a certain temperature or keep it nice and warm inside uh, in order to... Uh, obviously something to do with the accuracy of the readings of this thing given that it can do micrograms I guess it has to be able to sense tiniest little signals so now we have a giant hole in our oven and uh, I'm sure I can cover that up with something but there is the offending tantalum the giant black mole on the top of it now so there's even a little bit of a solder blob popped out the side or metal blob I should say it's probably not solder so it is the top pin, or the one closer to that outer edge. And it does go to our little device under the polystyrene. And pull it out. Oh, I can still smell the charcoal from that. So the number is 225L, which appears to be a 2.2 microfarad 35 volt. And I highly doubt that I have one to drop in. Well, all I've got right now is this electrolytic 2.2 uh, at 50, so let's put that in. It will have to go back in the chassis to test, so we will need to trim those legs a bit. I still want to know what rail that goes back to. Yeah, straight off our 5 volt regulator. Let's plug it in. Well, it's quiet. There's no chattering of the mechanism. Let's take some voltage measurements. Okay, so from ground to the output of our 5 volt regulator, we have, yeah, 5 volts, check it out. Now to the output of our other regulators. What do we got? 24, 25 volts, positive. And our other one over here, uh, negative 12. There we go. Let's unplug it, and I'm just going to check the temperature of that bridge. Nah, nice and cold, nice and cold. Everything is running cold. That's good. The transformer is not hot. I think we've solved it. I think that's the one. Let's get the LCD back on and find out if it's if it's not brain dead and it hasn't fried the little microprocessor there. Which, if you're wondering, is an 80C51. Put down a cloth so we don't scratch up the front of it. We need to remove the tape from here I'll, I'll, I'll gradually heat it I will heat it up I'll try that and be ever so gentle we don't want to fracture the glass so I will use a hundred hundred degrees and some distance just so it's not super hot check it on my hand first because we don't want to delaminate anything <laughs> in the structure of it put your finger there so if your finger gets too hot you know it's probably too hot Let's see if that works. It feels about maybe 40 degrees. Uh, it's kind of falling apart to be honest. I might just try just a light scrape. You don't want to be pushing down into the glass. You just want to be pushing the tape off of it. Yeah, let's bring in the alcohol I think. See if we can't encourage it a little better. A little smoother. 
I don't want to be pushing on these chip on glass either. They've got a clear resin over them, which is soft. And if you, uh, if you push on them too much, you'll probably upset the little bond wires. So just be very careful about that. Well, the alcohol certainly helps to get the, uh, the old foam off anyway. Maybe I should just take the foam off and then put the new tape onto the old tape left on the glass. It might be safer. It might be safer. How are we looking? Still good? We haven't turned it black from heating it? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah, that, that is... Um, the new tape will probably stick to that okay. So that's what I'll do. I'll just get the whole foam off and then, then add tape to the uh, what's left of the other tape. Where's my tape? I don't have any of the foam type of tape with a little bit of thickness to it, but... I've got this thin stuff here, so I'll just I'll build up a couple of layers. Maybe I plug it in first. And it'll line up exactly with the LCD. So if I was to position the corners such that top left and top right landed on the plastic supports, then we should be Good to go. A little bit of pressure. I hope the top cover has a little bit of a leeway for error. I may have overhung the left side slightly. No, oh, not by much. <laughs> I think we'll be good. She's better than it was before, just floating around in there. And we still need to cover up the hole in the oven. I just remembered there's a control panel on the top cover. Now this may not light up, you may have to plug that in and push the on off button. But let's plug it in anyway and see what it does. <gasps> oh, power off! Yes, at least it knows the power's off. And it's uh, functioning to the point of being able to display that. Let's plug in the top cover. Okay, let's see what this is going to do. We have our power off. Let's push the on off button. <gasps> busy. It says busy. There we go. I don't hear any noise. I don't quite know what all that mechanism is designed to do. But that's really interesting. Now, I'm thinking maybe, maybe there's a warm up period. As you can see, the mass is going up yet we haven't put anything on it other than the um, little weigh table itself I'm hoping that's not a bad thing that it's just counting up can I tear this? Um, this is T here we go so that's that's teared it, that's zeroed it at the weight of the platform so anything we put on that will show up it's probably reading the air flowing around me or something. I'm just going to blow straight down on top of that and see how much it picks it up. That is really cool. <laughs> so, very sensitive device. Uh, I don't know what state of... Um, I mean, look, it does zero. So, it is working. And uh, we just have no idea how calibrated it is. But let me see if I can find something of a known mass. 
Let's see if we can be a little scientific about this. Put a shot glass on there. I don't know how heavy a shot glass is. 67 grams. Now I'm going to tear that. No, you stop counting up. Okay, so if I take that off, it should be repeatable. We have a negative reading of the of the mass of that, so if I put it back on, it should be zero ish. There it goes. Well, 30 mils of water is 30 grams, isn't it? So let's fill it up and see what it says. How close is it? Whoa, look at that. Of course, you know, how do you read <laughs> the water against the line that's, that's like that le level of resolution? But anyway, that's pretty much on the line. It's 31. It's just over if you're supposed to line the line up with the top most edge of the water as it sits. I would say it's just over. So there we go. It's, it's not that far out. It's, it's pretty good. I'm going to call that a win. How about we get this thing reassembled, uh, get the power supply screwed back together, one last test, send it on its way. Pretty sure this is not being used in the lab. However, there is a button marked Cal. I'm not going to touch it, because <laughs> it'll ruin everything. I wonder how well Kapton tape sticks to polystyrene. There we go, I went around a couple of times, that will cover the hole, that'll help. That'll be better than nothing. And I think a little bit of hot glue should... Uh, Hold that down. It doesn't need a lot, it just needs enough to keep it in place. It's going to be kind of sandwiched under the LCD as well, so yeah. I need some funky assembly music. I should screw the base down before I put the walls on. Let me just uh, run around the <laughs> run around the middle and do them um, first, just in case. We're going to have to reattach these little. Uh, door slider dampers. That's going to be another process of uh, removing the old tape. I want to say that these little nubs on the handle face forward. I actually don't remember what way they came off. But if they face backward, it's just going to stop the glass opening as far as possible. So I'm going to make it face forward. Let's get the base plate in. So there's a plate there. There's a fancy ring for it for some reason. It's got quite a lot of weight to it for a small device. Now we need to resolve this, so we'll take off our added wires. Now that sits back in the housing and the primary uh, winding connections just press fit up against there. These screws into this are quite long and therefore they get very tight going in and out. Pop that back in there. I'm really impressed we didn't like cook the transformer or destroy that bridge rectifier uh, when it was getting hot under the fault condition. I'm gonna so 
yeah, okay, maybe we didn't need to replace those capacitors, but this thing's old. We'll leave them in. It's a, it's a good thing that we did anyway. It'll, it'll last probably longer than the rest of it now. <laughs> Clip that on there. Clips at the bottom, screws at the top. And a lot of downward pressure so it doesn't slip. Turn it on. It'll do its uh, self-check. And ready to go. Nice and dirty, isn't it? There we go. Fingerprints everywhere. And it um, it must tear when you first turn it on. But unlike the last time, it's not counting up. We'll let that little oven warm up. We'll give the most accurate readings. I don't honestly know how much difference it makes. Maybe it makes all the difference. So I just leveled it. You can adjust the feet at the back and there's a little spirit level there in the back and you've got to get the bubble in the center of that. And I just did that. And in doing that, we are now negative uh, 0.0124 of a gram. So it's interesting how that little, little bit of movement to level that out had an effect there. So let's drop our little shot glass on there and we will tear I guess it didn't tear perfectly. No, it teared a lot faster. I'd love to know what that mechanism under there is doing, if, where those motors come into play when, when you're doing stuff. Alright, so that's pretty well teared off. We can pick it up and put it down and it should be repeatable. You would hope. There it goes. Precision. Let's fill it with water. What do we got? There we go. 31.6 mils. Just over the line again. Anyway, camera battery is about to go dead. Hope you all enjoyed that one. A lovely little box enclosed uh, analytic scale. Give it a thumbs up if you like that and uh, hang around for the next one. Catch you all later.